So, we are in St. Petersburg, the northernmost metropolis in Europe and the second city in Russia in terms of population. Northern capital, city of three revolutions, cultural capital, northern Palmyra, city on the Neva, northern Venice, city of white knights. This is a far from complete list of unofficial names of St. Petersburg. Each of them is like a brief description that allows, without even looking at encyclopedias and reference books, to get an idea of its geographical location, historical significance, and role in modern Russia. Friends, welcome to St. Petersburg. Welcome to Russia. Walking with Andrei Aprelsky again. This time I traveled from Moscow, the capital of Russia, to the northern metropolis, the city of St. Petersburg. I took the train to Vitebsky Station. This is one of the old historical train stations in the city center. Today we LL talk about the history of St. Petersburg. This will be a useful walk for anyone interested in Russia. We LL also talk about how St. Petersburg lives under Western sanctions. There are about 40 minutes ahead, where we will walk along the central streets of the city and I will tell you about it. You can see many details of the city. If you've been here before, refresh your memories. If you haven't been to the city, this is a reason to come here. Our walk will take place in the summer of 2023, it is now 7 o'clock in the morning local time. The city of 5 million is still sleeping, but is gradually coming to life and waking up. Today is June 20th. As you know, in St. Petersburg, due to its northern latitude, there are now so-called white nights, when the sun sets below the horizon for only a couple of hours. Well, have a nice walk and enjoy watching. Don T forget to write comments about St. Petersburg and like this video, donate money and subscribe to the channel. Now we arrived in the city by train from Moscow. And we immediately arrived at the Vitebsk station. Usually trains leave for the Moskovsky station in St. Petersburg, but this time there was an exception to the rule. That s actually good. Vitebsky station in St. Petersburg is really beautiful and can be shown in more detail. Vitebsky station is the oldest in St. Petersburg and in Russia. It serves suburban destinations, sends and receives long-distance trains, including international flights, serving about a thousand people every hour. Near the building there is the Pushkinskaya metro station and the Zavenigorodskaya interchange station. The first building was wooden, one story. It was opened in 1837. The current huge building in the Art Nouveau style, familiar to St. Petersburg residents and guests of the city, was created in 1904 according to the design of the architect Brozovsky. Even then the station was equipped with elevators and conveyors. In the following years, the station was rebuilt and restored more than once, preserving the historical appearance of the monument. The building contains recreation areas and long stay rooms, storage rooms, cafes and shops, a first aid post, and other socially significant facilities. Vitebsky Station in St. Petersburg is so magical that you can hardly believe in the reality of its existence. The train to Hogwarts could easily depart from here, or some twisted story in the style of Agatha Christie could begin. The station was comprehensively restored in 2018. Now, everywhere in the building we see references to various regional variations of style, mainly the Viennese secession. The authors of the project took a lot from the interiors of the Vienna metro. Passengers then inevitably felt not only the spirit of European capitals, but also the speed at which the world was changing. This was an era when technical innovations were introduced one after another, but were still a luxury item. Another striking technical innovation is elevators. The platform is located on the second floor, and the problem of lifting luggage was solved with their help. Today, when I hear that the station is not very convenient, I understand that the surest way to modernize the building is to return it to the state of the early 20th century by modernizing the elevators. The point is also that the building is an architectural monument of federal significance. Here you cannot simply cut through a wall and organize an escalator more subtle solutions are needed. But apparently the politicians of St. Petersburg do not have enough money for this. The station was one of the first fully electrified buildings in St. Petersburg, but at the same time they tried to organize as much natural lighting as possible. Plus, the idea of the absence of boundaries, social and technical, is embodied. This is generally inherent in modernity. There were no completely blank walls at the station. The rooms were connected to each other and flowed into one another. By the way, according to the project, third-class passengers could enter the waiting room and the first and second-class restaurant. The area of the latter was calculated based on this. But the main function of the building, the competent distribution of passenger traffic, was the key to comfortable movement around the station.
St. Petersburg, being the most important economic, transport, cultural and scientific center, St. Petersburg with a population of 5 million at the same time remains one of the centers of Russian history. It is no coincidence that the center of northern Palmyra and its associated architectural monuments are included in the UNESCO World Heritage Lisan. We will not exaggerate if we say that it was in the city on the Neva that large-scale events took place at different periods, which became fateful not only for Russia, but also for the whole of Europe. The victories of Peter the Great, the Golden Age of the Empire, the Silver Age of Russian poetry, the October Revolution, the heroic defense of Leningrad, all this is remembered by the granite of the Neva banks. During my walk, I managed to meet and talk with one Finn I knew. Unfortunately, I do not have a recording of this conversation. This is what he told me over a cup of coffee. Apparently, Finn Pertula told me, I expected to see Russians suffering under the yoke of sanctions, a destroyed country and other troubles. Alas, he was disappointed and apparently disappointed the Finnish press, which did not fail to interview him upon his return. It all started at border control. So he told me his story. The Russian border guards congratulated me on the fact that today I was the first tourist crossing the border. They were extremely polite and careful. I went to check out St. Petersburg, which I have visited dozens of times. The city looks the same as before. The only thing that makes me think about the events in Ukraine is advertisements for service at the front and enrollment in the contract army. There are really a lot of such advertisements. The Russian government has the task of recruiting an additional 400,000 people and training them, forming divisions and new regiments. In general, the shops are full of products, the cafes are full of people. Finn told me that he noticed the rising prices in rubles. Despite all the sanctions, the Finnish tourist calmly found both French cognac and Australian wine in St. Petersburg. True, it costs more money. Finn drew attention to the presence of a large number of Chinese cars on the streets. These cars are especially common in taxis. My interlocutor also noted that there are no fewer people in St. Petersburg, but foreign speech is heard much less often. There are very few foreign tourists. Mostly the Chinese walk in groups around the center of St. Petersburg near the attractions. There are almost no Europeans, although five years ago the situation was completely different. What do you think happened to St. Petersburg after the introduction of sanctions? Meanwhile, we walk along the legendary Zagorodny Avenue of St. Petersburg towards a place called Five Corners. The history of Zagorodny Prospect goes back far into the 18th century when the southern border of the city ran along the Fontanka River and there was a real country with dachas and vegetable gardens. Until the 30s of the 18th century, an ancient pedestrian path to a Ekaterinov ran in the direction of modern Zagorodny Prospect, and in the early 30s there was already a road here. Gradually, the city's borders expanded, and the territory along the future avenue began to be built up with houses in the second half of the 18th century. This now busy highway received the name, Country, in 1739. Until the moment the avenue received this name, it was called differently, Semenovskaya Street, Front Perspective, Officers Street, Vladimirskaya Street. Poets, artists, and composers once lived on this avenue. The poet and artist Taras Shevchenko rented an apartment in house number 8, composer Glinka lived in house number 42, and Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky lived in house number 25. Composer Rimsky Korsakov lived in house number 28. Now a memorial museum is opened in his apartment. From the second half of the 18th century, dachas here slowly began to be replaced by urban buildings. But until the middle of the 19th century, the development of Zagorodny Prospect was still dominated by wooden houses and vegetable gardens. Occasionally, residential stone houses were also erected here, with very modest facades in the style of strict classicism. Since then, house number 18 has remained unchanged until our time. Many St. Petersburg merchants not only lived on Zagorodny Prospect, but were also owners of apartment buildings. Their first floors were occupied by numerous shops and workshops, and the living quarters were rented by middle-income townspeople, townspeople, that is, minor officials, creative intelligentsia, doctors, teachers, retired military personnel.
The provincial image of the area around Zagorodny Prospect began to be lost with the approval in 1854 of a ban on the construction of wooden houses, which extended to the entire left bank of the Neva up to the Obvodny Canal. From that time on, wooden buildings quickly began to be replaced by stone ones. Most of the old wooden buildings burned down during the fire of 1862, which I will talk about a little later, when we go to Rubenstein Street. By the 1870s, they were found here only occasionally in isolated neighborhoods. Zagorodny Avenue is one of four streets, Rubenstina, Raziajaya, Lomonosova, forming the famous and legendary intersection, Five Corners. This is where we are coming. Probably everyone is attracted by this magnificent house, topped with a turret, which stands at the intersection of Rubenstina Street and Zagorodny Prospect. This is Ioff S. Apartment Building, built in 1914. The owner of the house was a rich man. He was involved in the furniture and antiques trade. At that time, on the ground floor of the building there were expensive shops selling furs, hats, corsets, as well as wine and fruit. There was a cinema on the second floor. In this house in the 30s of the 20th century, Lydia Chukovskaya, daughter of Korny Chukovsky, lived with her husband, theoretical physicist Matvey Petrovich Bronstein. The famous Anna Akhmatova often visited them. Well, then we have already turned and are walking along Rubenstein Street. Rubenstina Street is the main restaurant street in St. Petersburg, and possibly in Russia. There are more than 50 houses and more than 50 cafes, bars and restaurants to suit every taste. Rubenstina has already become an independent brand and a meme at the same time. It is here that the taxi driver from the most popular video of the Leningrad group is trying to take passengers, which finally established the main tourist specialization of St. Petersburg. Over the past 10 years, the street seems to have reached the limits of saturation. By this summer there were almost no free places left for new establishments. On the same street is the House of Culture, where the Leningrad Rock Club was previously located, which you may have partially heard about. You may know such groups as Aquarium, Boris Grabinshikov, the Kino Group and Viktor Soy, or the music group Zoo. Until 1929, Rubenstein Street was called Troitskaya. Once upon a time it was a utility passage running along the private part of noble estates on the Fontanka. Historically, this is the first communication between Nevsky and Zagorodny prospects. Until the 1860s, the entire area around the current Dostoevskaya metro station resembled the present-day Varitsa rather than St. Petersburg. Two or three-story stone houses seemed like skyscrapers among the predominant wooden buildings. Some vegetable gardens, goats grazing, a dog barking. The people who lived here were mainly people connected with the main trade artery of St. Petersburg, Bolshaya Sadovaya Street, representatives of small businesses and the then guest workers who worked for them, mostly natives of the Yaroslavl province. The current development of the street was determined by the catastrophic fire on May 22, 1862. This happened on spiritual day, when the traditional review of merchant brides took place in the summer garden. All the merchants crowded along the main alley of the garden, watching the fashion show of mothers and girls passing through the ranks of spectators. Suddenly, at 5 o'clock in the evening, a rumor spread, a Praxin Devor was burning. The cab drivers immediately inflated the prices, so that rather corpulent merchants had to either pay some unheard of price for the bankas, or, puffing and panting, run along Bolshaya Sadovaya. The reality exceeded all the worst expectations. A Praxin Devor had already burned down. A strong westerly wind was blowing, so the fire spread across the Fontanka. By nine in the evening everything up to Zagorodny Prospect had burned down. As a result, a wasteland was formed two steps from Nevsky, extremely attractive for development.
Meanwhile, we had already turned onto Sherbakov Lane and walked towards the Fontanka River. Almost all the blocks adjacent to Rubinstein Street and the shadow side of Nevsky were built at the same time, in the 1860s, when Emperor Alexander II was on the throne. The architecture of that time was exceptionally ugly. This is Dostoevsky S. Petersburg. A five- or six-story stone box was built with the maximum number of windows, their number is proportional to the rent received by homeowners from residents. The architect treated the facade like a provincial beauty with makeup, the thicker the better. Only instead of rouge and whitewash, he applied a plaster pattern, drawn mainly from German albums on architecture. And we have already reached the Fontanka River. The Fontanka River is familiar to every tourist who has been to the northern capital. The watercourse originates from the Neva and stretches through the central and Admiral Tayski districts of St. Petersburg to Galerny Island, where it flows into the Bolshaya Neva. There is an embankment on both banks of the river. Its eastern part, the even side, begins at the Prechechny Bridge on the Kutuzov Embankment, and the western part, from the embankment of the Moika River, immediately behind the Summer Garden. This point is most often the starting point for those who want to walk along the embankment of the Fontanka River and admire its sights. The length of the embankment is almost 12 kilometers. Of course, this is a lot for a walk and few people want to reach the end. Usually tourists are limited to the central district, interrupting the route at Nevsky Prospect, Lomonosov Bridge or on Gorokovaya Street. You can see more interesting places and monuments on water excursions. The routes of such programs include the sites of the Fontanka River embankment in both districts, allowing you to save time and look at the city from a new perspective. Earlier in 1712, a small muddy, sometimes swampy and wide, up to 200 meters, river with islands and calm backwaters was called the Nameless Channel. It acquired its modern name in 1737 with the construction of the famous fountains of the Summer Garden. It was through its bed, on the site of the Pantolemanovsky Bridge, that an aqueduct was thrown from the high water and clean basin of the Likovsky Canal. With the development of shallow waters for construction, the width of the river gradually decreased. On its banks were built, luxurious estates with separate harbors, a summer residence, the Palace of Peter the Great, and the Palace and Park Ensemble Summer Garden. Until the 18th century, it was the watercourse of the Fontanka River that was the border of the city in the south. In 1752, the riverbed was cleared and strengthened with a wooden embankment. Later, the famous architect Kavasov prepared a project for granite embankments. Large-scale work to straighten the riverbed, reconstruct and build the granite embankment of the Fontanka took nine years and ended in 1789. Later, repeated cleanings of the Fontanka bed took place. In 1828, special dredging machines began to be used precisely for these purposes. As a result of cleaning work, the river became navigable, and in 1892 the first passenger steamships appeared in its waters. Today, pleasant boat trips along the Fontanka, inspection of mansions and residences on its embankment are included in the program of many tourist trips around St. Petersburg. Meanwhile, we are approaching Nevsky Prospect. In front of us is the Enichkov Bridge and the Pink Palace on the right, the Belosilsky Belorsky Palace. Walking along Nevsky Prospect, it is impossible not to notice the large pink palace of the Belosilsky Belozersky princes, decorating the Fontanka Embankment and the main street of St. Petersburg. It was built in 1848 and became a striking example of Russian Baroque, a fashionable style at that time. The architect of the palace, Stakenschneider, is also a famous master who built several residences and pavilions for the royal family and nobles in the northern capital and Peterhof. 
Andrei Ivanovich developed not only the external appearance and plan of the building, but also personally worked on its interiors. Anyone can visit the palace of the Belosselsky Belozersky princes. To do this, you don't even have to sign up for an excursion, because in the former residence today there is a cultural center that regularly organizes theater, music, dance, and other events. Nevertheless, now the Anichkov Bridge continues Nevsky Prospect. The Anichkov Bridge connects Spassky and Bazanyani Islands. The main city highway, Nevsky Prospect, passes through it. Perhaps every tourist walking around St. Petersburg has walked across the Anichkov Bridge. After all, it is listed in all guidebooks and is included in the list of the most important attractions. Interestingly, the design of the bridge is nothing special, but its highlight is a group of sculptures depicting the stages of taming a horse. The statues have long become symbols of the cultural capital. Various urban legends are associated with them. The horses on the Anichkov Bridge were installed in November 1841. It is known that the sculptor Pyotr Klot created monuments to decorate the site of the university embankment, which is opposite the building of the Academy of Arts. According to the project, the master had to cast only two figures, but Klot did not manage to finish the work on time and Egyptian sphinxes were installed on the pier. Later, the works of Peter Klot were planned to be placed between the Admiralty and the Winter Palace, but they also changed their minds. As a result, the sculptor himself proposed using horses to decorate the Anichkov Bridge. Since there were only two sculptures, we decided to simply duplicate them. The finished bronze sculptures were installed on the western side of the bridge, closer to the Anichkov Palace. These were the works, a horse with a walking young man, and a young man taking a horse by the bridle, and plaster copies of them were temporarily installed on the pedestals on the eastern side. Duplicates were cast quickly, but Emperor Nicholas I presented them to the Prussian king. New ones were made only in 1843, but these sculptures also became an imperial gift. They went to Naples. Since 1846, the horse tamers on the Anichkov Bridge again became plaster. After this, Klot decided not to create any more copies, but to cast two new compositions, Young Man Charging a Horse and Young Man Overthrown by a Horse. Thus, in 1851, a famous group appeared demonstrating the four stages of taming. As you can see, we are already walking along Nevsky Prospect in the morning. Nevsky Prospect is the main street of St. Petersburg in the very center, where many famous attractions are located. Its length is about 5 kilometers, and you can walk it from start to finish in about an hour. Nevsky Prospect appeared on the map of St. Petersburg just a few years after the city was founded. It developed as the main entrance road to St. Petersburg from the south, from Moscow and Veliki Novgorod. From the very beginning of the life of St. Petersburg, only one road led to the city from the south, the Novgorod Tract, which runs along the route of modern Likovsky Prospect, around Karachnaya Street, the road divided into several paths. One of them led west towards the village of Pervashina and the estate of the Swedish officer Konau, to the mouth of the Fontanka River. It is obvious that it was initially used to transport food to the Admiralty, founded on November 5, 1704. This path was not easy, the road was often washed away. Much has changed since then as we see it. As Nikolai Gogol wrote, there is nothing better than Nevsky Prospect, at least in St. Petersburg. Today the words of the classic are still relevant. Thousands of tourists travel to the northern capital to see not just a street, but a real landmark. Any building on both sides of the highway is an architectural masterpiece and a piece of history. They are best viewed during the day. And in the evening go towards Dumskaya Street, popular with tourists, especially foreigners. Here, in a small area, small bars and pubs are concentrated, where people party all night long. By the way, the odd side of Nevsky is called the shadow side, and the even side is called the sunny side. And on the avenue, it is always three degrees warmer than in other places in the city. Nevsky Prospect is almost the same age as St. Petersburg itself. In October 2018, the city's Central Highway celebrated its 300th anniversary. The story began in the 18th century, when Peter the Great ordered the construction of a road from the Admiralty to the Alexander Nevsky Monastery. The order of the king founder of the city was carried out by two teams. On one side, the captured Swedes built, and on the other, the monks of the monastery. They were supposed to meet somewhere in the middle of the road, which they planned to make absolutely flat. However, something went wrong and a fracture was formed. 
In the place where the highway seems to break, today there is Vostania Square, which roughly divides Nevsky into two parts. Next, we turned onto the large Lytiny Avenue. Now we are already walking along it. How do you like this scenic highway in the morning? The avenue was not always like this. The avenue received its name from the foundry yard, created under Peter the Great in 1711. Lytiny Devor was located in the area of the current Lytiny Bridge over the Neva River. The production of copper cannons and other artillery weapons was located here. In 1713, the Lytiny Devor was connected by a road that would later receive the name Nevsky Prospect. The name, Foundry Perspective, became official in 1738. Regular construction began in 1770 in accordance with the Commission S plans for the structure. In 1771, to the south of the Foundry Yard, the Arsenal Building was built on the site of the Cannon Yard. At the end of the 18th century, the site on the avenue where house number 22 is now located belonged to the Preobrazensky Regiment. Initially, Lytiny Avenue was built up with wooden houses. At the beginning of the 18th century, workers actively settled here, working mainly at the Lytiny Devor. Various workshops opened along the road, and at the corner with Nevsky Prospect, something like a labor exchange appeared. We had already passed this intersection earlier when we turned off Nevsky Prospect. Craftsmen looking for work gathered here. This place was then popularly called the Lousy Exchange. Day laborers who had no specialty and would take on any job offered their work here. Street hairdressers scurried among them, ready to provide their services right there on a stand right on the sidewalk. In 1806, after the opening of the Church of the Vladimir Mother of God, the part from Nevsky Prospect to Vladimirskaya Square began to be called Vladimirsky Prospect, Soon this area began to be called the foundry part of the city. In 1848, a decree was issued banning the construction of wooden houses in the central parts of the city, one of which was then the foundry district. In 1851, Lytiny Prospect was extended to the Neva, and a floating wooden bridge was built across the river. The entire foundry part in the second half of the 19th century was considered the most prosperous and comfortable. Lytany Prospect became famous for its numerous bookstores, many of which are still open today. The writer Nekrasov lived on this avenue. In 1852, house number 42 was built. Countess Yusupova lived here. In her youth she was known for her beauty, and at the end of her life she very much resembled the heroine of Pushkin S story, The Queen of Spades. There is a legend that the Countess was the prototype of this literary heroine. However, by 1852, the Queen of Spades had long been written, and Pushkin was no longer alive. In 1860, a house was built at number 36, Fraction 2. This is Kresky S. Apartment Building. At different times, Odoevsky and Porogov lived here, and the editorial offices of various magazines were located here. From 1875 to 1879, the legendary Lytany Bridge across the Neva was built, which rises every night to allow ships to pass along the Neva. In 1898, the House of Officers Assembly was built. Now this place is the House of Officers. In 1918, Lytiny Avenue was renamed Volodarsky Avenue. And in 1922, a monument to Nekrasov was opened on Lytiny Prospect, and in 1946, his museum apartment was opened in the house at number 36, Fraction 2. But bad luck, Already in 1944 the historical name was returned to the avenue. Since then, Lytiny Prospect has worn it proudly and unchanged.
As you understand from this walk, St. Petersburg is a treasure trove of stories and architecture, people and events. A real historical cake. Many historical eras are mixed here. St. Petersburg developed under the Tsars, and under the Communist Party, and in the era of modern Russia. But he leaves no one indifferent. So come to St. Petersburg for a visit, I especially want to see more Europeans, as it was in past centuries. Well, with this we will say goodbye to you. Be sure to rate this video, recommend it to your friends and forward it to each other. This will help the video rank better in YouTube searches. Well, as always, leave your comments under the video, be sure to write how you liked or did not like the city of St. Petersburg, the areas in which we walk today? What do you think about the Russian northern capital? Also, don't forget to watch videos from Istanbul, Turkey, Georgia, Belarus, Russia on my channel. Go to the channel and support me by watching the video. Let me also remind you that you can help me with the development of excursions with your donation. Links will be under the video. And we will definitely see you in new episodes on the channel soon. Be sure to subscribe and give your ratings. ILL see you soon.